I walked outside and I looked north and it was just, I mean, it was just glow. I mean, it was just so bright. And then I looked over to the east and I could see flames to the east too, above the trees over there. And I'm like, oh my God, it's just coming every direction, Oakland fire over again, you know. Right after I got back to Massachusetts, all these fires broke out in Northern California. Santa Rosa, where I had stored my VW bus, was particularly hard hit. And you kept seeing on the nightly news about these fires going through Santa Rosa. And there were two or three times I called the storage place. We were getting a lot of phone calls from all over the world. People worried about their stuff. And I think people, more people who could see the news knew more what was going on than we did. I had no idea what was going on. Fortunately, my bus was spared, but Santa Rosa was hard hit and the devastation was widespread. You can drive all over this county, it's crazy. And there's like from here to Calistoga, which is what, 10 or 15, 20 miles away. Yeah. It's just burned up houses all the way there. Wow. And if you drive that way over to Sonoma, another 15 or 15 miles, burned up houses everywhere, all the way over there. My original plan was to do a 90-day loop around the United States. But after living in the bus for 45 days and getting to California, I decided to change that plan. I was, I was pretty exhausted. The bus was getting a little smaller every day. And so I decided to put it in storage out in California and break this trip into two parts. And so I came back to Massachusetts, um, had some good rest and recovery, uh, got back into my comfortable home, got back into the life I love with Diane, and uh, we uh, hunkered down, got through the Massachusetts winter. Uh, spring is on its way now, and um, I'm ready to bring Zorba home. My career was as a social worker, and I retired in 2016, my last 30 years with Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston. I decided I wanted to fulfill my lifelong dream of driving across the country in an air-cooled VW bus, and told my wife that this was my retirement plan. She wasn't crazy about the idea, but said she would meet me wherever there was a nice hotel and spa. I have to admit, I was not as enthusiastic about the trip driving Zorba back east as I was for the one going west. Perhaps it's because I knew how challenging it was going to be. The heat of the desert, the need to find a safe place to park every night, and the knowledge that the bus was certain to break down at times. All that was ahead of me. The route that I took out to California was really through the central states. And now I'm going to take a different route coming back, more of a southern route. I'm going to head south through central California, the San Fernando Valley and then cross the southern edge of the Sierra Nevadas and head to Death Valley. After a few days in Death Valley, I'm going to head through the southwestern states into the deep south and then up the eastern seaboard. Good news for my first day on the road is that Zorro was running better than ever. I covered 100 miles that first day. The bad news is that the last 10 miles were by tow truck. I was zipping down California Highway 132 when Zorba decided he was done for the day. He lost all power. We coasted to the side of the road. Strangely, the ignition key was stuck and I could not remove it. I got some help first from Ken, the tow truck driver and then Elliot, my mechanic back in San Francisco, and Jem, the mechanic I found in Modesto, 
California. Soon, Zorba and I were back on the road. Valley, Zorba and I encountered a group of people doing something way cooler than the bird watching we do back in Newburyport. They were jet watching. I think I read Zorba the Greek when I was in college. That name Zorba uh, always had a lot of meaning to me. Uh, I read a lot of Nikos Kazantzakis, who wrote Zorba the Greek. Uh, I read a lot of his books. There was something about Zorba's personality that I always sort of strived for. Uh, his ability to sort of live in the moment, live for the present, not to overly plan and to really sort of be open to whatever experiences came. And some of them are going to be bad. And, and Zorba, you know, was the one who always, like, you know, something bad happens, you drink a little ouzo, you dance, and you move on. And, uh, and if something good happens, you celebrate that. And so, so that, that spirit of Zorba was something I always wanted to carry with me. Uh, through my life and uh, something I always, you know, strive to have. As I traveled west on my original trip from Boston to California, Zorba took on a persona for me. He wasn't just an old VW bus. He became more of a traveling companion, someone sharing the experience with me. And leaving him in California, well, I just wasn't comfortable with that. I spent three days in Death Valley. It's a beautiful place to hang out, just absorbing it, taking it in. I hiked the sand dunes. I hiked up some side canyons. And I just enjoyed the beautiful sunrises and sunsets. The plan is to meet my brother John in northern Arizona. We're going to spend a day on Lake Powell, do some boating, some sightseeing in the canyons, and maybe even some water skiing. From there, we're going to head to northern New Mexico, where we plan to camp and do some aircraft archaeology. started innocently enough when I rendezvoused with my brother John in northern Arizona on Lake Powell. We decided to rent a boat and explore the many canyons on the lake. 
We also thought it would be a good idea to do some water skiing. Do so you think the water's that long? I don't know. I'm implicating my brother in this, although it was really more my idea. And to be fair, my brother and I were not novices at water skiing. We did a lot of water skiing when we were young, behind a boat in Kansas. But we were teenagers then. Uh, decided I would go first. <laughs> Which also meant I, I went last, because after I hurt myself, <laughs> the activity was over. Without going into all the details, I tore my hamstring. Our day ended on the lake, and the search for medical care and storage for Zorba ensued. No, there isn't any footage of me screaming in pain, but there is this last known photo of me standing on two legs. And who knows where the trip goes from here. I spent four weeks back in Massachusetts letting my hamstring heal, but by then I was ready to return to Arizona and, and get back on the road with Zorba. Diane has this theory that my brother John is trying to kill me. And I could see where she might actually think that because I typically get hurt whenever we get together. But actually, I get all the credit for that. John's the one who always managed to get me out of these predicaments. Like the time I got altitude sickness and they had to helicopter me off Mount Humphreys in Arizona. There was the hike we did in Australia where we came out of the forest covered in leeches. My sons always accused me of I like that I would burn my popcorn just so that they would or they wouldn't want to take any from me. <sighs> I just like my popcorn. Fifteen years ago, my brother and I took up the hobby of aircraft archaeology. We like to hike into the desert and try to find old aircraft crash sites. We decided to do some of that on this trip. The site we were looking for was a Navy seaplane that crashed in August 1945, five days before the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. There were seven servicemen on board. None of them survived the crash. This particular site is in a lava field 25 miles southwest of Grants, New Mexico. We searched the area using satellite imagery and we saw an object that looked foreign to a lava field. It coincided with several of the other clues we had, and we decided to center our search on that area. You want me to start climbing? Yeah. Almost looks like a trail there. Neither of us had ever hiked in a lava field and didn't know what to expect. What we saw when we reached our starting point was pretty imposing. We were looking at a 40-foot high wall of lava. And I think, I think this is exactly what the doctor wanted me to do. My hands turned full. <laughs> All right, let's head on. Scaling this wall got us to ground that was never level, and every rock you stepped on would shift under your foot. It was like walking through a giant backyard barbecue grill. My hamstring was starting to hurt a bit, and I'm sure this is not what the doctor ordered. I cannot do a whole lot of filming. For 80 meters, it says go this way. But my wife needs her Oh, Jerry, I see something. I've got is a little. It, it looks like it's a uh, an engine part. Yeah, yeah, you can, can you see that? When we got there, we found an extension of debris field. It looks like this, oh, this is a, a huge section. Normally, when you find, you know, these crash sites, you're lucky to find nuts and bolts. Here's a huge wing section. Wow, this is huge. This is a gearbox. 
as is always the case when we find a site, the feeling of success is muted by the knowledge that people died there in service to our country. All I can do is to say something, say nothing. All I can feel There's a lot of fires out here. It's very dry. Well, my last three nights, I've not been able to have uh, campfires. to the seminary together. My plan is to meet up with Art at his sister's house in Louisiana. From there, we're gonna spend a week touring Mississippi, both visiting some civil rights sites, as well as taking in some of the Delta Blues. I've always been interested in the, the history in the Delta, and some of that history, it was happening during our high school years. And I think you and I were in a little bit of a bubble in the seminary. We would see all this happening on television, but it, it seemed a little distant. Uh, but I think it influenced us a lot and, and sort of helped us to find uh, who we were and, and what our, our consciousness was about the world. And you really couldn't avoid it unless yeah. you just stuck your head in the sand. You had the Freedom Riders uh, in Mississippi. You had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 being passed. Uh, it seemed like the world was on fire sometimes. So, so I know for me, uh, the things that I saw and witnessed, the history being made, I wanted to get a little closer to it. I wanted to actually sort of go to some of the places that we were experiencing uh, through television and, and sort of stand where some of these, these moments occurred and experience it in a different way by being there. We went to Money, the location of Bryant's store, which became the flashpoint for the Emmett Till tragedy. And then we went to Glendora. Um, we ended up on the bridge where they had uh, uh, thrown Emmett's body into the bayou. We had to go through weeds and um, watching for snakes, the whole business. Uh, got up on the bridge and wow, what a remote area. There was nothing that sort of indicated anything of significance had happened there. It was no by talking memorial. to people in the town that we discovered they told us where the bridge was. And, and just standing on that bridge and knowing what happened there uh, almost 70 years ago, uh, it was just really sobering for me. It was, just, uh, it was just very sad. It made me feel sad more than anything to know that something that horrendous happened in that very spot. Uh, where we were, and so it was, it was a very quiet, sobering moment for me to be there. 
One of the things that um, reminded me, like where we're at on civil rights, that type of thing, is you've got this sad story of uh, a young boy that was murdered. Somebody has tried to develop the Emmett Till Highway. We kept seeing signs for that, and we would drive by these signs. There were dents in them where people had shot at them. You know, you may think that people uh, are shameful of that whole thing, uh, and maybe not. We went to see some live music that night with a greater understanding of why the Mississippi Delta is the birthplace of the blues. While visiting the Delta, we stayed in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and there was no better place to stay than the Shack Up Inn. The Shack Up Inn is actually a collection of sharecropper shacks that have been transported to the site of the Hobson Plantation just outside Clarksdale. The Hobson Plantation is notable as the site where International Harvester built and tested the first mechanical cotton picker. These shacks have been fixed up a bit, but not too much. And Art and I felt right at home. I've always felt that one of the greatest gifts I've been given in life is to have a friend who's known me my entire life. Uh, I just think, you know, through the, we've known each other now for over 65 years. You know, one of our uh, shared experiences was the uh, Eagle Pass Eagles. Oh, yeah, the Eagles. <laughs> that was our neighborhood football team. We lived on Eagle Pass in Louisville, Kentucky, Eagle Pass Road. Uh, we decided to form a football team. It was you, me, my brother John, uh, Randy, and George. Uh, Randy Will and George Deusner, yes. Yes, and we would challenge other blocks uh, to play us in football. We have always been proud of the fact that we never lost one of those games. And we did have this elaborate playbook. When the Eagle Pass Eagles got in a huddle in a game, we weren't scratching out plays in the dirt. We would P40 onto break. break. <laughs> been a long time. All right, if you're going. We had a nice spot, nice big open field. And we decided to have football practice. In the Mississippi heat. I brought a football with me. 21 Omaha. Oh, ow, ow. We were trying to remember what the, some of the plays were that we ran. Well, you're, you're off a hamstring injury to I, begin with. That's right. Get out. Damn shit, hut, hut. I am backing around oh, another no. person. <laughs> yeah. I have I have put on the weight of another teammate. Just a little rusty, that's all. I took off and I thought I should not be doing this uh, because I'm gonna collapse. It's going long. But that didn't stop us from having practice. No. Uh, no. Totally unacceptable. Oh no! No! <laughs> My bad. Oh, oh. My bad. You stop. It's on me. Ah. This is going to be like a blooper reel. Yeah, shit. Hut, hut. It took us at least five minutes before we completed before. a pass. <laughs> Somebody oh. caught a pass. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. My hamstring was hurting. Yeah, I could hut, barely hut. breathe. The heat was slowing me down. Nice. Drop it in the old bread basket. I felt like we had practiced for a good half an hour and I needed to take a break. And then when we when we looked at it, our watches, we realized we only practiced for eight minutes. A few minutes. <laughs> oh. Eagles forever. Here, here. After a week of touring the back roads of Mississippi and hanging out in the Delta, listening to the blues, I was ready to head for home. I needed to make one stop in Montgomery, Alabama, because Zorba kept stalling out. But after that, I jumped on the interstates and I headed for home as fast as I could. You hear a lot about how divided this country is.
So I was certainly very conscious of that as I was driving. I wondered what it would be like to sort of travel through these states, be on the back roads, you know, meet some of the people along the way. And it, it was always sort of in the back of my mind. It's like, which side of the equation is this person on? I will say it was, it was frankly kind of hard to tell because when you're dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, when it's just you and them having a conversation, I couldn't have been more well-received. So it did leave me feeling like we got to find that common ground again, that there's just good in all of us, and let's find a way to sort of bring that out in each other and, and find our common ground rather than this focus on, on being so different. So well, now I'm back home having fun with my family. When people ask me if I enjoyed the experience, I always pause. It was enjoyable in so many ways, but that was never the goal. The goal was to have the experience and take from it whatever I could. There was always a mix of feelings along the way. Exhaustion, joy, frustration, awe, aloneness, but always a feeling it was what I wanted to be doing. My real goal was to be engaged, present, and always open to whatever the road might bring me. I feel in that I was successful. And to me, that is what the road is life really means. The goal is not to seek enjoyment, but to stay engaged, be present in what we're doing, and learn along the way. The hard things in life are often the most meaningful, and then joy flows from that. Perhaps Zorba, the Greek, not the VW bus, said it best. Life is trouble, only death is not. To be alive is to undo your belt and look for trouble. I guess driving across the country in an old VW bus is just another way of looking for trouble.